another artist new to the city, was also taking surrealism into uncharted waters. He came not from the frenetic atmosphere of avant-garde France, but the altogether calmer world of provincial Belgium. René Magritte was born in the town of Lessines in 1898. The son of a merchant and a hat maker, he was given a conventional bourgeois upbringing and went to art school in Brussels at the age of 17. Supporting himself with a job designing wallpaper, the young Magritte began to develop the visual style that would make him one of the most puzzling and most famous painters of the 20th century. Magritte's painting is essentially a game of mysteries. He recognizes what we're going to anticipate when we see a particular scene, and then he gives us something shockingly different. There's an interesting poetry of ideas that goes on in Magritte that I like a lot. They're incredibly simple ideas that somehow touch what it is like just to wake from a dream. Very familiar, but just slightly wrong. Magritte spent much of his later life living in a quiet Brussels suburb. In 1965, the BBC's Monitor paid a visit on Magritte and his wife at their comfortable home. But true to his enigmatic nature, the artist didn't speak on camera. And yet, was this bowler-hatted bourgeois the real René Magritte? Magritte put on a bit of an act. Uh, he wore a trilby hat, but if he saw a photographer, he put on a bowler hat. Uh, <laughs> he would then walk down the street in his bowler hat. He played the game of being ultra-orthodox in his dress and the way he lived. But inside his brain, he was uh, seething with rebellious, irrational thoughts. Although he never spoke to the BBC, in 1965, the master of mystery granted a rare interview to Belgian television. You liked the mystery when you were young. You liked the adventure. You liked Fantomas. You liked also a certain detective American, a certain Nick Carter. Ah, yes, Nick Carter and not Pain Carton, bien sûr. Est-ce qu'il y a une influence pendant votre œuvre, par exemple, de ces personnages? Je ne crois pas parce que le le mystère dont il s'agissait dans ces livres est un mystère à clé, enfin un mystère qui peut avoir une solution. Oui. Or, s'il s'agit de mystère dans mon œuvre, il s'agit d'inconnaissable. But if Magritte's work was unknowable, one of the dark sources of that work was revealed by the artist himself. When he was 13, his mother, who was mad, had been trying to kill herself on a regular basis. She even jumped into the water tank in the attic to try and drown herself, and it didn't work. So Magritte's father had locked her in her bedroom, but she escaped one night, jumped in the river, and according to Magritte, she um, took off her nightdress and wrapped it round her face and jumped into the river. It's now believed that this idea that the boy saw his mother's veiled face uh, when she was drowned is a fantasy that, in fact, the body wasn't discovered for 17 days, by which time her face would probably have rotted away. It's more likely that the boy was told that his mother had lost her face uh, without knowing any details. But it would have been sufficient, no doubt, to have preyed on him and to left him with a haunted mind. Je pense que le monde est un mystère et que le mystère, on ne peut rien en dire et que donc 
on ne peut pas, ça ne peut pas être un sujet d'angoisse ni d'espérance. Ma grippe n'est pas un mystère, au fond, non plus. Ah, si ah. Nous sommes tous un mystère. Nous sommes une partie du monde qui est un mystère lui-même. Like his paintings, Magritte remained impenetrable. But this most enigmatic of artists was about to be usurped by a new arrival on the surrealist scene. And he was no shrinking violet. Bonjour. Good morning. It's the for the first time born any kind of traumatism. From an early age, Salvador Dali had set his sights on global fame. Born in Figueres, Spain, in 1904, by his twenties, Dali was producing some of the most intriguing surreal paintings of all. His pin-sharp dreamscapes rapidly gripped the popular imagination. Their contorted forms conjured up by an exceptionally strange creative mind. In Paris, Dali befriended surrealists like Ernst and Man Ray and quickly became the poster boy of the movement. But where Magritte had shied away from television interviews, for Dali, they were a chance to promote his favorite creation, himself. In 1955, the journalist Malcolm Muggeridge interviewed the painter for the BBC's Panorama. The first question that I wanted to put you, it really ought to be about modern art, but I can't help it. There's some delicious frivolity in you which makes me ask it is, how did you manage to produce those marvelous moustaches? In the last moment of dinner, I not clean my finger. Yes. I only put a little in my moustache, remind for all afternoon, very, uh, very efficient, efficient, efficiently. Mm. Do you have any trouble with it at night? I mean, do you have to peg it or anything like that, or does it stand up at night? No, in the night, uh, clean every night. Mm. They come in soft, uh, sleep. So at uh, night it droops down while you're sleeping. Completely, completely. And then in the morning, up she goes again. Three minutes. Only in three minutes, fix my moustache. And then you feel you can face the world with that wonderful moustache standing up. Yes, because uh, every day becoming much more practical for my inspiration. <laughs> The global face of surrealism courted the attention of celebrities. Dali was a great talent, there's no doubt about it. But ultimately, he was interested in fame and in fortune. And he sold out. And, you know, his friends knew it, the surrealists knew it. He knew that he'd sold out, but Dali didn't care. First, it dissolves. Happy bubbles, but devoted bubbles. Then the alka seltzer shoots into the stomach. Here, it neutralizes that bad excess acid. Meantime, the special buffer aspirin is speeding into your bloodstream to all places of pain. So those beautiful places will feel beautiful again. alka seltzer is a work of art, truly one of a kind, like uh, Dali. Dali himself made no bones about his motivation, as he revealed later in his career in a BBC Arena documentary. Salvador Dali, myself, is very rich, and Dali loves tremendously money and gold. And Dali sleep the best after one day of war, receive one tremendous quantity of checks. But did Dali's slavish pursuit of celebrity and wealth finally damage his art? Opinions are still divided. Dali didn't waste 
the talent he had, he corrupted it. What went wrong with Dali was not that his hands couldn't do it anymore. They always could. What went wrong with Dali was that his mind turned into the Dali mind. A beautiful crisp apple has gone very, very rotten. I think Dali was much more important than most people realize. Uh, it's his own fault. <laughs> Uh, he acted the buffoon, and people remember that too much. But the, the fact is that Salvador Dali is one of the most important artists of the 20th century. And if people belittle him because of his weaknesses and his follies, it's a great mistake. Because Dali alone, in front of a canvas, it could weave magic. But the magic of modern art had found some powerful enemies. The Nazis put so-called degenerate modern artists on their wanted lists. And with the start of the Second World War, many were forced to flee for their lives. The first great wave of modern art was over. Yet the previous three decades had seen a total transformation in the possibilities of what art could be. There is an explosion of possibility and of diversity in art. The art today is a consequence of all of those, those things that happened during that time. This was a ripping apart of art. This was a, a, a complete restart. Picasso comes along and he questions the fundamentals of the image. Duchamp comes along and he questions what an art object is. The surrealists come along and they start exploring the inner mind of the human being. I mean, no one's been down there before, you know. It's dark, it's horrible, it's spooky. So the whole of this early period was spent going places people haven't been before, in art. You can't look at this great art being made at that time and not sense the excitement of the change and the difference of it the avenues that were being opened up for the future. And as the artists dispersed, many travelled to the city that was to take over from Paris and where the next chapter in the history of art would be written.